we're going to prepare our children for careers in engineering, we're going to have to re reverse engineer engineering education. I gave a presentation recently to a group of undergraduate engineering students. And at the end of the presentation, I, I entertained questions. And one of the students, uh, Kimberly, asked if we could discuss a topic that was outside the scope of the presentation. I said, sure, what's up? She said, I'm graduating next semester. And I've been interviewing with companies. And she said, they're telling me that they prefer that I have more experience. And she says, uh, that kind of angers me. <laughs> she said, I just spent five years busting my butt in college, meeting all the requirements, jumping through all the hoops, doing everything I'm supposed to do. I was inducted into Tau Beta Pi Honor Society, and now they're telling me I need more experience? How am I supposed to get a good job without experience? And how am I supposed to get experience without a good job? And experience doing what? What's that even mean? Well, I told her what it means is these companies are expecting you to bring more to the table than just your academic experience. They expect you to set yourself apart from your competition, and they expect you to hit the ground running, and that gets you the job. And five years in education, students spend over 20 years in education preparing to graduate and enter the workforce. It's only the last five of, five of which they actually see the light at the end of the tunnel and then start cramming and preparing for that, that transition into, into the career. They start at preschool, kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. They get into college, they graduate, they have their diploma, they're all excited and they celebrate. The family celebrates, the boyfriend celebrates, the girlfriend celebrates. They're all ready to go to make that transition into, the, into a career. And what happens? Boom! <laughs> they hit a wall. A wall that stands between education and career. A byproduct of the very institution of which these students are a part. On the one side, you've got education. It's the education domain. It's everything you've been doing for the previous 20 years. Academics, grades, AP classes, applications, and my favorite, accreditation. On the other side, you've got career. You've got entering an a incredibly competitive workforce. And these companies know what's going on. They see your transcripts, they see your grades, they see your letters of recommendation, they see everything you've been doing. But they answer to shareholders. And to them, it's all about the bottom line. Education, career. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see this picture, the first thing that I see that has to happen is very obvious. In the words of former President Ronald Reagan, we have to tear down this wall. <laughs> we have to flatten the learning curve, not the knowledge curve, using career as the metric. Well, what career knowledge are we talking about? This comet illustrates the knowledge, the accumulation of knowledge, cumulative knowledge that engineers acquire over the course of a career. And it's extensive. It's diverse and very extensive. Branding, self-branding, that's self-branding, competition, collaboration, tricks of the trade, economics, finance, budgets, networking, research and development, and intellectual property. But whereas this represents the culmination and cumulative knowledge that engineers acquire over the course of a career, the amount of knowledge that engineers graduate with is represented by that small sliver on the comet, that small one-dimensional sliver. That one-dimensional sliver is producing one-dimensional engineers and companies are demanding more. Now, wouldn't it be great if engineers could graduate with all this knowledge instead of that one little sliver? Well, how do we do this? Many years ago, I taught a class, undergraduate class, 
called microprocessor-based system design. And I gave the class a project, a project to design and build a medical device. This medical device was called, it's called a pulse oximeter. You've probably seen this. It's a small device that's clipped to a patient's finger and monitors certain vital signs. And I gave my students two things. I gave them a high-level concept, just an understanding of what this thing did, and I gave them a pile of obsolete parts that I scrounged up in the department. And these students had never seen a pulse oximeter, much less design and build one. So I divided the class into 11 groups of three each, and I will tell you that at the end of that semester, these students turned in the most impressive, innovative projects I ever saw in my academic career. They were awesome. Around that same time frame, I began volunteering to make presentations to my four-year-old daughter's class. And the first presentation I made to her class, class of four-year-olds, was entitled, How to Make Microchips. <laughs> Seriously. And I'm not sure how I was going to do this, but I figured I'd just, we'd put together a monologue and we'd have some fun. So the day of the presentation, I walk in, and I hand out to each of the kids one potato chip. I gave each kid one potato chip. And the thought was, if they walk away with nothing else, if they learn nothing else from this presentation, I want them to know the difference between a microchip and a potato chip. <laughs> and that you can eat a potato chip. Well, what I wasn't sure of, and again, going in with no expectations of whether or not these kids could learn and comprehend this, much less retain it. And I found that out about a year later. My daughter comes home from school one day, brings her home from school, and she says, Dad, we went on a field trip today. I said, really, where'd you go? She goes, we went to the telephone switching center. And they're giving us, our, our class, a tour. And the tour guide walks us past all these rows and rows and, of, of racks of, of electronics. And he sa she says he pulls out a rack of printed circuit boards populated with integrated circuits. And she says he turns to us and he says to our class, these little things, as he's pointing to the integrated circuits, he tells them, these little things are little brains. And they do all the magical switching in the, in the electronic switching systems. My daughter raised her hand and she goes, those aren't little brains, those are microchips. <laughs> <laughs> what I discovered was the model I used for those four-year-olds for, for four was the same exact model I used for those undergraduates. Basically the same exact model. Same delivery, different content. And as I, as I began to refine and hone this, this model, I discovered something interesting. I could apply this model, and, and subsequently did apply it, to what I think is one of the most critical transitions in a student's education career. And that was to apply it to support students, transition students, into, the, into the, uh, an op op opportunity or career, into the workforce. And so I built this model based on the experiences I had with each of those kids in those different age groups, starting with a high-level concept, which is all this is. I call it the prize. This prize represents a transition into industry and a career opportunity. I start with, a, with, the, with the prize using career as the metric. And then with guidance, I deliver that using a, what I call a top-down methodology, as opposed to a bottom-up methodology, which students are pretty much accustomed to throughout their education. This required a top-down because the, the knowledge at the top is what I call the, the, the pinnacle, the ultimate. But more importantly, more importantly, the students provide the creativity, the innovation, the education foundation, and the resources. This model's been used over 20 years successfully based on this exact, this exact layout. And sometimes, sometimes the students define the prize. One of my students, Kevin, came to me one time, one day, and he said, he said, Dr. Athan, I want to work for that Fortune 500 company. He didn't say, I want to work for a Fortune 500 company. He said, I want to work for that Fortune 500 company. And I thought, well, aren't we ambitious? <laughs> so, 
So I said, okay, well, we have to do a couple things. Two things. One is we have to get you an interview with that company. And secondly, we have to prepare you for that interview. I said, you go off and find out when they visit our university, when they interview at our university. And I'll put together a curriculum. And I said, but be advised. This is going to be a rigorous, grueling curriculum. It's, we have fewer than two months, and it's going to be more, more like a boot camp. And I said, if you're up to it, I'm up to it. Well, he came back a few days later, and he said, he said, this company doesn't even visit our university. They don't interview, they don't even visit. Well, I said, well, which university do they visit? Which is the closest university that they visit? He said, the closest university they visit is University of Florida in Gainesville. <laughs> so, so after a few months, going through this grueling boot camp, Kevin drove to Gainesville, he attended the interview. Long story short, this Fortune 500 company that semester interviewed 35 students throughout Florida. They shortlisted five, they hired three, and Kevin was their number one draft pick. The model works. It works for four-year-olds, it works for elementary kids, junior high, high school, and college. But the biggest encouragement came recently during a conversation with an assistant dean of engineering. I'm explaining to him in his office how this model works. And I'm just kind of going over the, the mechanics of the model. Now, I hadn't yet told him that the model has been used, this model has been used successfully for over 20 years. And I said, I got to the part about the top-down. I said, well, we, I use a top-down teaching method. And he stopped me. He says, I, you can't use top-down. He says, that won't work. You can't use it. I said, use what? He's top-down. We don't use top-down. Top-down doesn't work. And I said, why not? And he said, because it'll never pass an accreditation audit. And that's when I knew I was onto something. The system has to change. Well, how are we going to do this? This is going to take a new mindset, a new way of thinking, a new culture, new tools, and new curricula beginning in the first grade. And that grueling boot camp that Kevin went through, we spread that out over the life of a child's education, thus making it second nature. And what about Kimberly? Kimberly's graduating next semester. Well, Kimberly's case is actually the most unique and, and, and provides some very important insight into this model. First of all, nothing these kids learned is not anything they're not going to pick up and figure out on their own. These are smart kids. They're going to figure this stuff out. Eventually, in, in, in industry, and they go into a career opportunity, they'll figure this stuff out. What this model does is it does two things. One is it compresses and condenses all that information and knowledge you saw on the comet. And number two, it presents it much earlier in the education, in the student's education. It kind of takes a shortcut through time, if you will. Kind of like a wormhole. You know what a wormhole is. It's a shortcut through space-time. And that's the real value <laughs> of Kimberly's model or Kimberly's case. It's a shortcut through space-time. Our kids are amazing. And some are brilliant. And they want to be engineers and leaders and entrepreneurs. But we've got to stop dumbing them down. We should be preparing these kids for battle. Everybody wins. Let's make this happen. Let's tear down this wall. Thank you.